Hey there, partner. Hold on a second. Oh yeah, much better, much better. Welcome to my kitchen, a magical wonderland where the only limit is our imagination. But today we're just gonna make plain old bread. And look, I am not an expert. I'm Batman. And this isn't gonna be one of those how-to guides where I give you tips on proper technique or a set of instructions. Rules are for suckers. Heck, I'm not even gonna give you a recipe. It'll be a recipe for disaster. Are you done? Yeah. Instead, what I wanna focus on is some really interesting things that I like to think about when I'm engaged in the bread making process. Because as it turns out, it makes for some really great food for thought. Welcome to the joy of making bread. Alrighty then. I have divided this entire bread making process into four parts. Each one of them provides an interesting example or an analogy that I like to apply to other aspects of life. Here they are. The first is proofing. The second is kneading. The third is rising. And the fourth is the entire process of making bread. Are you ready? Let's do it. So the first stage is proofing the yeast. And the reason that you do this is to make sure that the yeast is alive. Like any living organism, it needs water. Not too cold, not too hot. Just right. The Goldie Zone. And it needs something to eat. But having a sweet tooth isn't the only thing that we have in common with yeast. As it turns out, about a quarter of the genes found in this yeast are also found in humans. And they're not identical, but some of them are so similar that you can take them out of humans and put them in yeast cells. And these new Franken yeast go about their merry way like nothing happened. It's pretty amazing how much we have in common with a single celled fungi. But the best part about yeast is watching them grow up. So let's take a look. Blushes and splashes, precious. Why are we making bread when we can just steal it from the two stupid fat hobbits? Yeast is our master now. Yeast will feed us. Why is it taking so long? I'm hungry. Give it time, precious. Give it time. You killed it, murderer. Sure. I hate you! Where would you be without me? I protect us! I feed us! Not anymore! What? Master is growing for us! Grow, Master! Grow away! <sighs> we told him to grow away! And the way he grows, precious! The way he grows! <laughs> Okay, now let's watch the yeast grow in real time because it provides an amazing example of exponential growth, something we never get to experience in our day-to-day -day lives. It's important to see because it can help us to understand other things that grow or spread exponentially, like the coronavirus or human population. As you can see, things start off slow but eventually you see these little hot spots popping up here and there. And as the ball really gets rolling, you have this explosive growth. But eventually, as the sugars start getting eaten up, things slow down and we approach some kind of limit. Okay, now I realize that humans and yeast are very, very different. Still, it is tempting to compare the growth patterns. Because if you look at the last 10,000 years of human history, you can see a long, slow, steady growth up until the point of the Industrial Revolution, where there is this period of rapid exponential growth. But if you look at just the last 50 years or so, you can see that that growth rate is slowing down more and more. 
leading to projections like these, that world population might flatten out over the coming decades. Now, here is the question. Are we as a human species approaching some kind of limit to our growth on this planet? And if so, will we need to rethink some of our economic systems or our lifestyles to cope with that new reality? Just a thought. Okay, so I mixed the yeast and the water with some flour and a little bit of salt and oil. And now it's time to get to work and start kneading the dough. So, when I kneaded dough for the first time, I failed miserably. And that's because when we encounter new situations, we rack our memory for possible scenarios that are similar. And we use those similar scenarios as analogies to give us clues as to what to do in this new situation. Well, the experience that I used for kneading dough was from my high school ceramics class. Mother Now, if you've ever taken high school ceramics before, you know that you have to knead the clay. And the purpose of this is to remove all of the air pockets from the clay so that it doesn't create any instability or explode when you cook it in the kiln. Dough, on the other hand, is a living thing. The yeast inside of this dough are producing carbon dioxide, which causes the bread to rise. So the last thing you want to do is try to force it all out. So the next time you're kneading dough for what seems like an eternity, you can sit and contemplate Mr. Roybert's failure and think about all sorts of other ways that humans may be engaged in faulty reasoning based on imperfect analogies. And look, that doesn't mean that they can't be useful. In fact, I'm gonna give you a whole bunch of imperfect analogies in this video. And then after you get bored of imagining different ways people fail at thinking, get creative. So what is the point of kneading, anyway, if it's not removing the air? That brings us to everybody's favorite topic. You love it, you hate it, you love to hate it. You know what I'm talking about. Gluten. Have you heard this one? Two proteins walk into a bar, a water bar, and they don't really know each other very well when they go in. But after knocking a few back, they form a bond. Nothing says lovin' like fresh dough in the oven. <laughs> there are two proteins in flour. These tightly wound squiggles, gliadin, and these more loose, flowy squabbles, glutenin. When combined with water, they form this matrix, or interconnected network, known as gluten. Think about an elastic fishing net, or maybe the safety net under a trapeze artist. When you knead the dough, you are mixing these proteins around, giving them more opportunities to form bonds and strengthen the network. But it takes a lot of time and energy, at least eight to 10 minutes by hand. So let's get back to kneading and thinking more deep thoughts. You know, many people like to think of history as a type of pendulum that oscillates between two extremes order and chaos, liberalism and conservatism, integration and fragmentation. But a clock is so mechanical, partner. Human society is a kind of network like gluten. What if our history is more like the process of kneading dough, where the different forces stretch us to our limits and the weak points tear, but eventually they get reincorporated and with each push and pull that tests us, we form tighter bonds to counter those forces. So what if the feeling that we have right now of being pulled apart to the point of tearing is really just a sign that we'll snap back together stronger than ever? And 
If not, well then I guess we need more kneading. What if God is a baker? Oh, these damn humans always aggravating my carpal tunnel. Now, after we've had all that fun working that dough, it's time to rest. It's time to let it rise. In this whole rising process, it's kind of an iterative cycle. Right, there's this active part to it, that is the kneading part. And then there's this passive part where we're letting it sit and do its own thing. In an hour, we're gonna come back and punch it down. And then let it sit and rise again. In another hour, we're gonna come back and we're going to knead it, fold it, shape it, and then put it in the bread pan. And then let it rise a third time. I think that's a really good, if imperfect, analogy for how you and I acquire new skills and information, how we learn. The active phase in learning is the one that we're all really familiar with, where we're pouring over a new material and we're trying to learn through repetition. Maybe you're doing a bunch of math problems using the same equation, or playing scales over and over again, or using flashcards to learn vocabulary. But many people don't realize that there's a passive phase to learning as well. Even when you walk away from that material, your brain is still busy in the background, processing that information and trying to integrate it into your existing body of knowledge. You probably think it's obvious that there's only so much information you can cram inside your head at one time, right? But you might be surprised to find out that it's probably a lot less than you think. So that's why during periods of intense study or practice, it's really good to take frequent breaks. Think about it like letting the dough rise. Your brain is the dough. And if you want some structure for how to do that, there's already a technique that you can use. Named after a tomato-shaped kitchen timer called the Pomodoro Technique. There are apps for this, so download one today. It will change your life. Now that we've patiently let our bread rise, it's about time to put it into the oven. But first, because I see this as a work of art, I think we should sign our name. And bakers used to do that by scoring the top of the bread so that if they had to share an oven, they know whose loaf is whose when they take it out. Right? You don't want anyone getting switched at birth. And now let's put that bad boy into the oven to cook. So I realize I've given you a lot of food for thought, so let's do a quick recap. During the proofing stage, we saw an example of exponential growth that yeast, viruses, and humans all exhibit given the proper conditions. While kneading the dough, we saw that we can strengthen certain networks like gluten given enough time and energy, and we wondered if maybe society doesn't share this general feature. While letting our bread rise, we saw that that made for a good analogy for the passive phase of learning, which reminds us that we shouldn't try to cram because our brain needs incremental rest. Now, is there something that this entire process can teach us? Partner, what is this? It's dough, right? And if you're the breadwinner of the family, you have enough of it that you can just pay professional bakers to do all of the proofing and the kneading and the rising and the baking and the cleaning for you. So that raises a reasonable question. Why should any of us do it? Is it worth it? Yes. Why? Because it demonstrates an important fact of life that when the process of making something, all of the work and the sacrifice is directly coupled to the reward 
that you get from putting in that time and effort, that is where meaning is derived. I like to think about it like this. When you go to the store and you buy a loaf of bread, how did you earn the money that you used to pay for that loaf uh, at work, right? But exactly how were you hosting a meeting, sending an email, selling someone something? What was the process for earning that money that you used to buy that bread? You can't trace it. Everything that we do at our jobs just goes into this big bucket, the money bucket. And whenever we need something, we go out and we take money out of the bucket and we buy it. I think this is part of the problem with why so many of our jobs feel meaningless. We end up just focusing on getting as much money as we can, filling up that bucket, and then we don't even really know how to spend that money in ways that make us actually fulfilled. We buy a bunch of really expensive, frivolous things that we don't need. So I wonder if, in fact, we are reaching some sort of limits to our growth as a human population and this process, this culture of consumerism is something that evolved along the way of that massive growth explosion. Maybe this focus is something we need to change. Maybe we can do that by focusing on simpler things that provide illustrative examples of where meaning still exists. What other activities give you a sense of meaning? Maybe we can learn from those experiences and come up with creative new ways to feel fulfilled in life. So partner, let's make bread. Let's break bread. And let's get better at living a fulfilling life together. So if you like this video, Subscribe, and I'll see you next time on The Joy of Thinking. Mmm. It really is good. Yeah. You are my, you are my sous chef now. You are my sous chef. Take your place.